We'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Ryan Williams. I'm from the University of Memphis. And we'll be talking a little bit about moderator analysis today. Uh, we're going to go over a couple of different approaches. Uh, we've got a lot to cover in an hour and 14 minutes, a lot of slides to go through. So uh, the way I would like to structure this is I'll, tr I'll try to get through the entire presentation. Uh, hopefully there will be a little bit of time at the end for some questions. Uh, if, if we do run out of time, I'm happy to talk to people individually about questions they have about their own projects, what I talked about here, and whatever else. Um, just out of curiosity, who here has um, conducted a meta-analysis of any sort? So lots of folks. Okay, has anybody in here done a uh, Campbell review? Okay, lots of folks. Um, hopefully, what, hopefully you all will get something out of this. Um, and we'll be able to talk about some, some approaches that we can use to explore variation in effect size estimates that we've collected. Okay. All right, so hopefully this is why you're here. Uh, we've, already, we've already computed a mean effect. We know the variance around the mean effect. Um, but before we even started our review, we, we were smart and we thought about a few at least a handful of different study characteristics, characteristics about the populations within those studies that we thought might explain why we're going to see differences in the effect sizes that we see, especially in a Campbell sort of review where we're dealing with social behavioral data a lot. Um, we're going to see pretty substantial variation in our treatment effects or effect size of your choice. Um, so we're going to have coded, hopefully, before we even got started with our analysis, hopefully we coded a bunch of interesting information about those studies that will help us make sense of the variance that we see in those effect size estimates. So the two approaches that we're going to make use of today, uh, at a very applied level, um, and I'll, I'll, I'll caveat here, we're going to move quickly through some of this stuff. Um, but as Terry noted earlier, um, we're on camera here, the slides are going to be up. Um, so there will be ample time to review, even if I'm going through things at a relatively swift pace. Uh, so bear with me on that. Uh, but we're going to try to make, make it through two, two major approaches of uh, moderator analysis. The first one is very similar to analysis of variance or ANOVA, and the second one is very similar to multiple regression. We'll call that meta-regression. Um, and throughout the, the talk, we'll try to include some tips and recommendations for um, potential authors of Campbell reviews of things that we want you to talk about, think about, and report um, in your reviews, in your protocols and in your reviews, okay? So here we go. Uh, a few assumptions for today. We're going to be working entirely within a random effects framework, um, primarily because most of the Campbell reviews um, will fit that framework a lot more uh, a lot better than a fixed effect framework. Um, so just know that that's an assumption. This isn't the only approach, but it's probably a, the approach that's going to fit a Campbell review uh, best. Um, at this point, we're going to have assumed that we've computed a random effects variance component. If you don't remember what that is, that's okay. We're going to talk a little bit about that throughout, um, throughout the talk today. And um, some different considerations for how we might use that random effects variance component. We're going to rely on software in here quite a bit um, because this is going to be a fairly applied practical session. Two software um, packages that we're going to use for today are very user friendly um, and accessible. Revman Review Manager is free. Has anyone used Revman before? Okay, so some folks are familiar with it. It's, it's, a great, uh, it's a great program and you can do a lot of things with it. Um, we're going to demonstrate a couple of things uh, with that package. And also comprehensive meta-analysis, CMA, is another package that we'll use. It is not free, but it has a trial version. Have folks used CMA in here? All right, great. Um, and I'll have some links. I have links here to both of those packages and some directions later on for getting the output that you'll see and starting up trial versions and whatnot. 
I think we also have a link to the data that we used. All right. So the first, um, the first set of moderator um, analyses that I want to talk about falls under the ANOVA framework. And so if you're at all familiar with ANOVA, I assume many of you in here are, um, most of what I'm going to talk about should seem pretty straightforward. Um, with, with a couple of tweaks here and there, uh, really we are doing analysis of variance and making adjustments based on our assumptions of where these effect sizes came from and the variances around those effect size. But the general approach is going to be exactly the same as analysis of variance, where we have um, some outcome, and our outcome throughout today is going to be our, our set of effect sizes that we spent many, many, many hours coding. Um, and we're going to use some independent variables, our moderators, to explain variation in those effects. And so under the ANOVA um, class, we're going to have um, one, one factor, one categorical variable with multiple levels or multiple subgroups associated with it. And we're going to be interested in, just as in any ANOVA, seeing if the means within those different levels, those different subgroups, are equal, right? Are there, are there differences? So one example that we're going to explore is publication source. And this is a fairly common uh, moderator. Do we see differences in mean effects between journal published journal articles, dissertations, unpublished manuscripts, and so on? So we'll, we'll explore that using a, a set of sample data. All right. Um, I said some of this already. Um, the things that we're going to need for our analysis, we're going to need a mean effect and standard error for each of our groups. Um, and uh, then we're going to test whether the means are statistically significant for me, from one another. The uh, mean effect and the standard error require an estimate of the <coughs> variance component. And this is going to be an area that takes a little bit more consideration compared to traditional ANOVA. Um, and we have a couple of options here. Um, and I'll talk about both of them in some detail. The first option is we can assume that each group has the same variance component. All right? So we'll estimate a weighted average variance component and use that for each of our subgroups. Another option, as, which is kind of under a more fully random effects framework, is we can assume that each of the groups, each of these subgroups, have their own variance, right? their own variance component. And so we can use a different estimate of that variance component for each group. And we may have a good reason to do that, or we may not. All right, so if we decide to um, to use separate estimates of the variance component for each of the subgroups, um, we're going to believe that the variation among the studies is different between each of those groups, okay? So it's larger or smaller depending on which subgroup you're in. As an example, we might be testing um, an intervention uh, of studies that use low and high income students and we might have good reason to believe that there's going to be greater variation in the, effect, in the effectiveness of this intervention or the, the effect sizes uh, for the low income groups, right? The low income sets of studies um, compared to the high income. Another example, the effectiveness of an intervention for juvenile delinquents may vary more for, for the group that had prior arrest compared to the group that did not have any prior arrest. Um, so these are things, so if, if we end up considering this route, uh, we need to be thinking very critically about what the theory um, underlying this assumption is. Do we have a good rationale for, for doing this? Because we can potentially, I'll talk about this in a moment, we can get ourselves into trouble with this, with this option if we're not careful. Uh, but if we do have a good reason to think that there's going to be greater variation in different subgroups uh, compared to others, this might be one route that we, we would want to take. Okay? The other route, which is pretty common, is assuming a common variance component. So we would come up with a weighted uh, variance component um, across all of the subgroups and apply that same variance component to each of the groups. And this will help us get our uh, weights for our moderator analysis and so on. Um, and, if, and if we do that, we are assuming that the variance component, the variance of the effects in each of those groups, each of those subgroups, is the same. Right? We're assuming a constant variance. 
So the caveat here is um, we, can, we can run into some practical issues if we go with the, the last approach. If we assume that each of those subgroups has its own variance component, and we end up in a situation which is common because we don't usually have massive, massive, massive numbers of studies. Sandra will. Uh, but uh, <laughs> uh, usually we don't. So we can end up, depending on the nature of our categorical factor, we can end up with sparse cell sizes. So small numbers of effects in different levels of this, um, of this variable. And to the extent that that happens, we can end up with potentially some really poor estimates of that variance component. Okay. So as a, as a cautionary rule of thumb, probably when it, something around at least five effects, uh, effect estimates per, per subgroup to get um, even a modestly stable estimate of the variance component. Uh, and so again, I would only recommend taking that route if you have a really, really good reason to do it and you have the data to help you get a, a stable estimate of those variance components. Okay. All right. Here's a little flow chart from Bornstein et al., which is kind of neat. Um, it kind of helps us navigate um, starting off from fixed and random, random effects choices all the way down to what we're going to do about our variance components if we end up in a random effect, effects framework. So do we assume that the studies within each subgroup share a common effect? That's going to dictate whether or not we end up in a random effects or fixed effect framework. Um, we're, we're entirely in random effects framework in, in this session. Do we assume that the true between study variance is the same for all subgroups? If yes, then we're going to com compute a pooled variance component and use that same, that constant vari variance component for each subgroup. Uh, if not, we're going <coughs> to compute separate variance components for each subgroup. So that's, I think it's a useful flow chart for making some of these decisions. All right, so here are the steps. Um, I think they're going to be pretty straightforward. The first one we've talked about, we have to make a decision about the nature of the variance component and what we're going to assume about the variance component or variance components. Uh, we're going to compute the mean effect sizes and their standard errors for each of our groups, each of our subgroups, and uh, compute uh, and compare the, the group mean effect sizes to see if they're different from one another. So hopefully this, this set of steps sounds uh, relatively similar to the basic structure of ANOVA, right? We get some means, get their standard errors, and we compare them, all right? And so now we'll walk through uh, an example. So we pulled some effect size estimates from, from this review from Eagley, Johannesson, Schmidt, and Van Engen, uh, 2003. Uh, the authors were looking at gender differences in transformational leadership which they described as establishing oneself as a role model by gaining the trust and confidence of others, okay? Uh, the sample data is, uh, the sample data that we're gonna use in here is just a subset of the full set of effect sizes. Uh, we're, we're just using 24. Again, this is, this is only illustrative, so I, I don't mean to replicate anything that they did, uh, but this is gonna help us illustrate the ANOVA <coughs> framework, and then we're gonna use the same uh, subset uh, under meta-regression. Uh, just as a descriptive note, uh, the female means were subtracted from the male means, so positive effect sizes are going to indicate that there is a greater uh, transformational leadership among males. So keep that in mind. Uh, I've embedded a few uh, directions here for what I'm about to do uh, in RevMan. Uh, so I'm not going to harp on a lot of these steps, but Again, they'll be posted for you all, so you can hopefully replicate uh, the, output, the output that you see me present in a moment. Uh, a quick note about what we're doing here is that RevMan is going to assume that each group has its own variance component, okay? So we're kind of in that first group of assumptions of what we're going to do with those variance components, and we're going to estimate a separate variance component for each group. And again, this, I'm already violating um, that cautionary note that I, I made a few moments ago about sparse cell sizes. Uh, we're going to run into that really quickly um, with only 24 estimates and three levels of our categorical predictor. So again, we're going to look at differences between uh, these effects, these gender differences on transforma transformational leadership um, uh, using journal articles, uh, dissertations, and unpublished manuscripts. Okay, so here we go. 
So if we, if we were to follow all of those steps that I listed on the last page, we would get a whole set of output that looks something like this. Um, and I think uh, kind of a, a good way to, and I'll break these out in a moment, but this kind of tells us, this shows us just immediately visually uh, what's kind of going on here. And we've, we've effectively got three separate meta-analyses that are being conducted. And we get a mean effect for the journal group by that first diamond, we get a mean effect for the dissertation group uh, and a mean effect for the unpublished group, okay? And I'll break these out here. Next slide. So here are our journal articles. Uh, we have a mean effect um, down here, the sub this subtotal line that's bolded out gives us our overall summary. The mean is about negative 0.05. The confidence interval ranges from negative 0.23 to 0.12. So it catches zero. Um, we, we, we effectively have a null, a null result here. No, no, no immediate evi evidence of a gender difference on transformational leadership among this subgroup, uh, within this subgroup. We have our heterogeneity statistics. Our variance component tau squared is 0.09. Um, on a chi-square distribution with 120 degrees of, uh, with a chi-square value of 120 and 12 degrees of freedom, it is statistically significant. There's substantial heterogeneity among this, uh, the effects in this, in this subgroup. Um, and then our overall effect is telling us the same information that we just interpreted from our confidence intervals. Okay. And we have the same results here for our, uh, our same, same structure of results for our dissertations. The dissertation group has a, uh, a mean effect of negative 0.47, ranging from negative 0.69 to negative uh, 0.26. So this is indicating that females are much higher on this transformational leadership uh, construct than males within this subgroup, okay? So that's a little interesting. And this is no small effect. Uh, that's a pretty substantial difference, and it's, it, it's non-zero, right? The confidence interval is not catching zero. The, um, and we'll interpret this with a lot of caution. Our heterogeneity statistics here, uh, tau squared is estimated at 0.02, um, and it is not statistically significant within this subgroup. Finally, our unpublished group, the mean effect is about negative 0.16, um, and it ranges from negative 0.30 to negative 0.03, and so that's also um, a significant difference in the female direction. So, and just as with the dissertation group, uh, we, we don't have any evidence here that we have significant heterogeneity among these effect sizes in the subgroup. Um, but again, that's, we should interpret that with a lot, quite a bit of caution because uh, it's pretty small samples. All right. Um, Here's a summary table of everything that I just talked about from those forest plots. Uh, we have a um, number of effect sizes that we're observing in our journal articles, our dissertations, unpublished manuscripts. We have their means, their confidence intervals, and their variance components. And so this is, this is not a bad way to go for reporting um, these types of results if you're going to go down the, the route of assuming separate variance components for these different subgroups. Um, it, definitely, if you do that, you want to report those separate variance components, and we want to know how many studies those variance components were estimated on. Um, see here, this is no good. Uh, I've got four and seven in the dissertation group. Um, if I were a diligent methods reviewer, I would probably ask the authors to reconsider um, estimating their variance component or using a pooled variance component unless they had a really, really, really good reason. Um, but chances are these are pretty unstable estimates. Okay. Um, another note here, um, testing the significance of those uh, tau squares is the same as testing homogeneity of the effects. Again, this is just like having three little separate meta-analyses, and you're going to work with four, four effect sizes, seven effect sizes, 13 effect sizes, um, and get means and do everything else that you would do for a meta-analysis, okay? So now we're going to move into what probably motivated us to do this in the first place. Are the means different, okay? And so um, what we're going to do to figure out whether or not those means are different 
is we're going to conduct a homogeneity test of those group means. So we're going to conduct a really mini little meta-analysis using three-point estimates and their standard errors um, and figure out whether or not they're different. This little set of output here is what RevMan generated for us. Um, notice here that they, this, this line here, test for between, uh, test for subgroup differences um, has a chi-square of 9.09 .09, and that is significant. So this is telling us that there, is, there are differences in these group means, okay? And so we'll, we'll try to figure out if we can, uh, if we can figure out what RevMan did there. Um, so we're gonna use the means and their estimated variances to compute the sums of squares that we need, uh, or the sums that we need, and uh, then we'll compute a variance, uh, a homogeneity test, okay? RevMan automated it for us, but if we do a little bit of um, simple Excel calculations, we'll pull our means out of our outputs, um, we can get our weights, right? They're gonna be the sum of the of one over the sample variance plus the variance component for that group. Um, so we do that separately for each of those. The variance is gonna be one over the sum of, uh, one over those weights. And um, so we do that for each of our groups and we end up with the sum of our weights. We'll end up with taking the product of the weight and the mean for each of our subgroups and end up with a a total for the weighted means, and we'll multiply our weights by the squared uh, means for each of our group and sum those up. If we use those, those sums, we can get our Q statistic, uh, which is 9.09 .09 in this example, and that's exactly what RevMan came up with. Um, so it's not magic, um, and it does work. So we do, we do with, with this example, using individual estimates of those variance components, we're seeing differences among these, these group means, okay? Now, we'll do, we'll run through a, a parallel example where we assume a common variance component, um, which for this subset of data, I mean, if this was a real meta-analysis, uh, this is probably where I would have started uh, if I was really interested in these, in this moderator. Um, only because of that sparse cell issue. Um, so uh, again, RevMan, uh, as a default, assumes unique variance components per subgroup. Um, we can get around this if we use comprehensive meta-analysis. There's a few bullet points here about how, if you haven't played around with CMA before, a few bullet points of how to get it and play around with the trial version. I think you can download it for a couple of weeks or like 10 tries, like opening it up and closing it, something like this. Um, but it's a, it's a very useful and, um, and user-friendly um, package. Also, the data is housed here. If you're interested after the training session, if you're interested in replicating uh, anything I did, you should be able to download the two, uh, the two data sets, or uh, one for RevMan and one for CMA. Um, if you are getting different results, let me know. Uh, <laughs> but you should, you, they should replicate. Okay, um, I, I've also embedded uh, a few um, screenshots here uh, to help you navigate through CMA. Um, and so I'm gonna not spend a whole lot of time on those, but those are more for you going back through and playing around with this if you haven't done so before. Uh, so mixed and random effects options, the same common uh, variance component. That's really the main step that we're interested in here group by, and here's some comprehensive meta-analysis output. So here's a kind of a stacked forest plot, very similar to what we saw in RevMan, and we have mean effects for each of our subgroups. Here are our journals, those were coded as one here. So these are, that's the mean for the journals and its confidence interval. This, this vertical line here is zero. So we, we still see no evidence of gender differences on transformational <coughs> leadership among the journal articles. Um, among the dissertations, we're, we're still seeing about a half a standard deviation between men and women on transformational leadership, and it is, it is statistically significant. Uh, however, in the unpublished manuscripts, um, we, we're seeing the, the overall Magnitude of the effect is in favor of women, but it catches zero. Uh, the confidence interval catches zero, so we don't have any compelling evidence to, to say that there, there's a gender difference in that subgroup. 
Okay, and then we have the overall, um, the overall mean. Um, I don't know if I noted this before, if it's on the next slide. Um, the, many of you probably know this if you've played around with this. The, the confidence intervals around each of the individual effects, those are fixed effects confidence intervals, which is kind of the default. Um, but it is random effects intervals around the means. Okay. Uh, there it is. Um, okay. Uh, and again, we're using the same variance component in this example. Here's a summary table that we can get out of CMA. Um, again, one is our journal articles, three is our dissertations, four is our unpub unpublished manuscripts, uh, our point estimates are our means, we have their standard errors, confidence intervals, again, um, this corresponds to what we interpreted from the forest plot on the, on the last slide. Down here we have our Q statistic that tells us something about whether or not there's heterogeneity among these means. Um, so here using that common variance component across all of those three groups, uh, we have Q of 6.67, two degrees of freedom, and it's still statistically significant. So we're still, we, we are still observing a, a difference between these, uh, these three types of publication sources, okay? So, the variance component that we applied was 0.08. If we scrolled back up to uh, the, the initial results that we, we were looking at in RevMan, you would find that, that we used that. That was the overall variance component estimate. Um, and so we ended up with slightly different, slightly different estimates, right? So when we assumed individual variance components, for those dissertations and unpublished groups, those are pretty small. Uh, those are quite a bit smaller than this .08. I think with rounding, uh, the unpublished manuscript group was near zero, like .0001 or something. Uh, so, so it made it made quite a bit of difference. In fact, we changed our our inferences about the gender difference in one of those subgroups. Um, and I would trust these results a lot more if this again if this was a a real-world scenario, okay? Here's a few notes on reporting uh, for random effects categorical analysis. Uh, the first thing that we want to make sure that we talk about are the assumptions that we made about those variance components or that variance <coughs> component. Um, are we using one or does each group get their own, okay? And we need a rationale for that, which can be combination of methodological and substantive or purely methodological if again we're in the, if we end up in this situation maybe I had a really good reason or a reasonably good reason to estimate different variance components I just may not have had the data to get good estimates of those variance components um, but maybe in a few years if the literature grows I could revisit that idea um, we'll want to know the random effects mean and its confidence interval the value of the variance components uh, or variance components, uh, the test of between group differences and um, whether or not it's statistically significant. So if you follow these guidelines, um, you're, you're gonna be reporting pretty much everything uh, a consumer would need to know. Um, and I would suspect most of, you, most of your methods reviewers would be very happy uh, with, with that reporting. So keep that in mind. All right, so we're gonna transition into uh, a slightly different framework, but very related framework for thinking about moderator analysis. Uh, so we started off with uh, ANOVA, or anal analysis of variance, um, and everything we talked about hopefully sounded a whole lot like ANOVA. Hopefully everything I'm about to talk about sounds a lot like multiple regression, okay? Because that's the framework we're moving into. We're gonna call it meta-regression. Um, <coughs> We're also assuming um, a random effects framework. So um, we, can, uh, we can use meta-regression to look at um, not just one moderator, but actually multiple moderators, which ends up being a nice attribute of meta-regression in contrast to ANOVA, uh, which is kind of fixed to, limited to a one-way ANOVA framework where we have one categorical factor and we'll look at differences between however many levels of that factor there are. Um, we can do meta regression in a number of different software packages, uh, SPSS, Stata, SAS, R, uh, certainly CMA um, and other specialized meta-analysis programs. 
Keep in mind, though, that there are going to be some tweaks that have to be made, especially about the point estimates and the, the standard errors around those point estimates, um, because they're not going to be quite accurate if we go with a traditional routine, even if we're doing something like weighted least, least squares, like, which we're going to talk about. Um, so something like CMA is going to do the adjustment for you. Um, if you're a diehard SPSS or Stata user, I would recommend using a routine, maybe, maybe a macro from David Wilson. Um, they're out there. They're free to download uh, if you're in one of those camps. Um, so just be, just be cautious of that. Uh, okay. As I, uh, as I mentioned a moment ago, we can use meta regression to look at a combination of moderator variables, um, which, is, which is pretty, pretty unique uh, in contrast to ANOVA. And we can also start to look at continuous moderators, right? So it's not just a grouping variable, but we can use a grouping variable plus a continuous variable or just a series of continuous variables, whatever it is. Hopefully, just as with the ANOVA framework, we planned for this beforehand. Um, and that's a, to all of our benefit. Who wants to go back in and start coding for moderators after they've computed their mean effect? Um, that's not going to be a whole lot of fun. And you might get called out for phishing um, if you haven't thought about it before you started coding. So hopefully, we had a, had a really good set of ideas about what variables might dictate the magnitude or direction of our effects um, before we started. All right. So here we go. Uh, the general, a very simple uh, regression framework for uh, meta regression model looks like this. And hopefully this looks very similar to a regression model uh, with our outcome being the effect size. So on the left side of the equation, we have an intercept that we're going to estimate. Um, we may not be substantively interested in the intercept. We might be. Uh, we have uh, X1 predictor, our first moderator variable. B sub 1 is going to be the slope estimate for that predictor, all the way through X sub P, B sub P, um, predictors and slopes. Okay? So we can throw in um, multiple predictors, um, but also keep in mind that the general rules for regression also <coughs> apply here. This isn't just because we, have, we coded all of these potential moderators that we should saturate our model immediately with all of those really careful decisions that we made early on. We want parsimonious models, and we want models that are going to uh, lend themselves to interpretation. Right? We want to make sense of these different moderators. Um, so we can run into the same, same issues in, in meta-regression as we would with multiple regression, multicollinearity that still exists. Um, and, and the like. So keep that in mind. Just because you have the data doesn't mean you should use it all or at least all at once. Okay. Um, this is just a, a little reminder here, um, and this shouldn't be a surprise to anybody. Everything that we've done up until this point, we've assumed an inverse variance weighted random effects framework for meta-analysis. We weighted our, our mean effect. We weighted all of our effects by their variance to get our mean effect and its standard error. Um, we're doing the same thing here. So we're going to weight our effects by the inverse of the variance plus that between study variance component, whatever it ends up being. Um, so we're using, we're not just using ordinary least squares in this case, where each effect size has the same weight. Um, but we're saying some, some effect sizes should contribute to the mean a little bit more than others. And that's going to be proportional to their variance. Okay. Um, we will need an estimate of that random effects variance component, just as we did in the ANOVA framework. Um, we have a couple of options um, in that, but most commonly we will we'll most likely assume a common variance component, and we're going to do that for purposes of today. So we're going to apply the same variance component to each, each of the studies. Okay. Um, in traditional or standard regression, we use ANOVA methods to evaluate the quality of a model or the fit of the data to a model. We're going to be doing the same thing uh, with meta regression. And we're going, we can use things like an ANOVA tables to get uh, sums of squares that are going to come in handy. And I'll talk about what those are useful for in a moment. And we can end up with a statistic that mimics 
uh, what F is telling us and the inferences about F um, that tell us something about whether we have something in our model that's getting us beyond just guessing the mean, right? So whether or not we have something in our model that's uh, a non-zero slope, okay? So two important statistics that we're going to use for meta-regression are Q sub M and Q sub R. So Q sub M is the model sums of squares, uh, which is on a chi-square distribution with P minus one degrees of freedom. P is the number of predictors or the number of moderator variables that went into that regression model. Uh, Q sub R is the residual sums of squares, and it's also on a chi-square distribution with K minus P minus one degrees of freedom, okay? And I'll talk about each of these independently uh, in the next couple of slides. So our Q sub M, or our Q sub model, is a test of whether at least one of the regression coefficients in the meta-regression model is non-zero, okay? When we have a statistical Q sub M, we would expect one of our slopes to not contain zero uh, in its interval. Um, on, on the other hand, Q sub R is the test of whether there is more residual variation than we would expect if the model fits the data. So if Q sub R is significant, then we have a significant amount of residual variation that our model did not take care of, okay? We might have made some gains, uh, but there might be some leftover work um, to do, right? So keep that in mind. Um, then we can also look at the point estimates, the slope estimates. We want to know if those which slopes are non-zero or not. So in standard regression analysis, we usually use T statistics. Um, uh, oftentimes we'll use Z tests um, in meta-regression to, to help us out with that. Uh, of course, we're gonna have confidence intervals around uh, each of our slope estimates too. So, um, and again, this cautionary note about doing meta-regression in standard uh, software packages if you do end up doing it in SPSS, uh, there will be you will have to make some adjustments um, to make sure that your standard errors are correct. Um, if you want to talk about that later on, we can talk about um, some resources um, to use. But there's plenty out there. Okay, so uh, we're going to conduct a meta regression in comprehensive meta analysis. We're going to use. Um, this is going to be a very simple meta regression. We're going to use the average age of the participants in each of those studies as a predictor in the model. So we're going to regress uh, the vector of our effect sizes onto um, the average age of the study. So one, one, one moderator. Um, and so again, I've got some screenshots here. If you haven't played around with CMA, um, you should be able to replicate everything that I'm doing if you follow along with these. Average age uh, and random effects method of moments is the estimation procedure that we're going to use for our variance component. And um, one one piece of output that we get from CMA is a scatter plot. We have our average age for each of our studies along the x-axis and our effect sizes uh, along the y-axis. And so we see a slight negative uh, relationship here, right? So as the average age of the study increases, it appears that uh, women tend to be a little bit higher on transformational leader leadership than, than men, um, at least a little bit here. Um, so we'll, we'll try to figure out if there, there is actually a statistically significant relationship here. And so here's the summary table for the random effects meta regression that we just conducted. It just hopefully looks not terribly different, at least this first chunk, not terribly different from standard regression output. We have a slope, a slope estimate, standard error, confidence intervals, and a p-value associated with that slope. We are retaining the null hypothesis here. This, we, 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 we don't have any great evidence uh, to think that the average age of the participants in the study predicts um, the magnitude of effect. Um, down here we have our Q statistics, our Q sub model, our Q sub residual, and our total. Um, and so these results pretty much coincide with what, we, what we're seeing. Um, keep in mind that that, res remember we said when Q sub R, that residual Q, 
uh, is statistically significant. It's telling us that there is more, more variance in those effect sizes to be explained. Uh, under this random effects model that we just conducted, um, it's saying there really isn't. Um, and so that, that makes sense that we're not finding uh, something like average age that explains um, that variance because there's not a whole lot left at this point under the random effects model uh, to explain. So um, don't be surprised if you find something different than this, but that's just what we found with our toy data set. Okay. Here's, um, I'm going to quickly go through uh, an example, a very nice example uh, <laughs> of how to do uh, meta regression and how to report it. Uh, so Sandra Jo Wilson and Mark Lipsy did a study on the effects of school-based social information processing interventions on aggressive behavior, uh, and there were two parts to this, right? Um, so we're going to show some output from the, this first part anyways. Uh, so the objective of the review, um, they wanted to examine the effects of universal school-based social information processing interventions on the aggressive and disruptive behavior of school-aged children. Program effects are examined overall and in relation to methodological and substantive differences across studies. So a cool thing that um, Sandra and Mark did with this study in their meta-regression is they, they identified a series of methodological moderators that they were really interested in retaining uh, within each of their meta-regressions. Um, and so those were kind of constant controls and their other moderators entered with the presence of those methodological controls already in there, okay? Which is a great, which is a great um, power of uh, meta-regression if you've got the data to do it. Um, here's a little bit of background on inclusion and exclusion criteria. And I'll go straight to um, some, of the, some of the results from their meta-regression. So they had, uh, looks like about five different blocks of different types of covariates, uh, student characteristics, evaluator, researcher, role in the study, delivery personnel, amount and quality of the treatment, treatment elements, and they looked at each one of these different moderators. And as noted at the bottom, again, these were entered with those methodological moderators already in the model. Am I getting that right? All right, good. Um, so a few, a few different um, effects emerged from their moderator analysis. They found differences between low SES versus mi mixed or middle plus, uh, middle plus SES groups. They also found differences, um, they found a significant slope. I'm guessing this was entered as a continuous predictor number of sessions per week, which range from one to nine. Uh, implementation problems um, could have been yes, possible no, uh, also a difference there, um, or an effect there. So um, this, is, this is a very simple and transparent, clear way to present uh, the results of actually quite a few moderator analyses uh, that were conducted. So. Um, if, if you are planning on updating a review, doing a review for the first time that's going to include some moderator analyses, I would strongly recommend looking at some of the existing reviews in the Campbell Library uh, that contain moderator analyses. And they'll give you a good sense of what, um, what uh, we're going to be looking for. Okay. All right, so things to report, things to make sure that we, we report in, in a random effects meta regression. We want to know the software that you used um, and the methods used um, to compute the results. Again, and that's going to be important because we want to make sure that so you, we weren't just uh, a little too eager or uh, to get our results and we forgot to clean up our standard errors if we just ran in ran everything in SPSS really quickly. Um, we want to make sure that we've made all the appropriate adjustments there. Uh, the methods used to compute the random effects variance component, um, there are options there. We used method of moments, we used maximum likelihood, restricted maximum likelihood. Um, the, the goodness of fit statistics, the Q sub M, Q sub R, we want to know those things um, and whether or not they're statistically significant. Um, and the regression coefficients, and at least their confidence intervals or um, p-values. Okay. So some final notes on um, 
uh, meta regression. Software can be limiting uh, if you're using prepackaged programs. Um, so, an issue that comes up with comprehensive meta analysis is that you can currently only enter one uh, moderator at a time, which may be okay uh, depending on your purposes. Uh, but if we wanted to do something like Sandra and Mark did, where we had um, you know, a chunk of moderators in each model and then we filtered sequentially each of our other substantive moderators through that regression model, uh, we would need to use something else. Um, oh, are they? Yeah. That's, okay. That, <laughs> I think it's, it's difficult to put that into that program. Yeah, I, I'm sh I know I would not be able to figure it out uh, very easily. Um, so um, RevMan also does not have the capacity to do meta regression. We can do the ANOVA version of moderator analysis in RevMan, um, but it's not going to handle multiple predictors or continuous predictors. Um, For, for meta regression, does it have to be? Okay, that may, that may be accurate. I thought you could specify category. Yeah, I thought you could, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think yeah, you might have to just dummy code multiple things, yeah. Um, uh, let's see, uh, again, if you're interested in using something like Stata, if you're interested in doing something more advanced like Sandra or Mark did or have a complex meta regression model, which I certainly encourage people to think about, um, especially as uh, reviews mature over time and more and more studies start flowing into a, a body of evidence, we should be using probably some more complex models to explain variation in those effects. Um, but we'll have to use Currently, we'll have to use something like SPSS or Stata and some macros associated with that. R is coming out with a bunch of different packages all the time. Uh, Wolfgang Weichbauer uh, manages the Metafor package, M-E-T-F-O-R, um, which is a great, um, a great um, you know, canned program in R. You don't have to uh, do any of it yourself. It, Keep in mind is that with any CAN program, there are going to be assumptions that the programmer made. Uh, so I think in metaphor, they, he always assumes a common variance component, which may be good for most of what we're doing uh, in meta regression or moderator analysis, but just, you just need to know that that's what's happening. Um, and of course, you can always build these things from scratch if you want. So that's my talk. Um, and I will take questions if you have them now. I don't know where we are on time. Oh, we have time. <laughs> questions? Yes? In meta regression, uh, we have uh, some, several ways to estimate uh, that posture. Uh, Do you use the method of moment? Yes, I use method of Um, so that method of moments, it's, it's, one, it's the most straightforward estimator. Um, and if we know, it's, it's effectively the Dersermonian and Laird estimator. But um, if, you, if you know something about Q already and some of the, these other things, um, you can get it pretty simply if you know the weights that you're, you're using. Um, and so it's, it's a non-iterative uh, estimator uh, versus uh, restricted maximum likelihood or maximum likelihood. Um, so I'm happy to show you a couple of things one-on-one -on -one if you want to talk about it a little bit more, but it's probably the simplest uh, to use. Yeah. I have a question. Yes. So let's say I'm doing a Mm -hmm. um, what are, what's the best way to kind of look for collinearity across my moderators and then what do I do about it? Yeah, that's Instead a good question. Two, two of my moderators are highly correlated. Yeah, that's a good question. I think as a, as a simple approach um, <laughs> or as a starting point, you can investigate things like bivariate correlations, uh, at least between continuous moderators. If you have categorical moderators, you can you know, even estimate something like an odds ratio to figure out the 
the degree to which they depend on each other or chi-square um, as kind of a preliminary step. Um, and then if you do have highly dependent uh, predictors, I would definitely choose one. Um, and that's only because we usually don't have a whole lot of data uh, to give up. Um, so we, it's important for us to keep as many degrees of freedom as we can. Um, outside of that, I don't know of any super advanced methods for analyzing things like variance inflation. It, it may be, it could be that we can use the same, same sort of methods for looking at variance inflation that we would use in standard regression, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just so, a thorny problem. Yeah. And if you're picking just, if you're picking one of the two that are highly correlated, you can't really do that a priori. So it, it becomes exploratory at best. Uh, uh, what do you mean by that? What I mean is, ideally, we specify all this stuff in advance. Yes. You can't really do that until you see what the correlation is. And so sure. you're going you're gonna to need to look at that in an update. Uh, I think it's I think it's fair game though I think it's it's fair game to um, set up your models and your protocol and you know we're really interested in socioeconomic status and prior achievement and something else. But you also have to specify the decision rule for which variable you're going to select if you get two that are higher. Yes, exactly. So okay. I, I think it's perfectly fair game to say right. uh, models will maybe ju uh, adjust it. Uh, well, the specification may be adjusted based on uh, methodological issues, um, multicollinearity included. Um, if we do have two highly correlated predictors, um, we'll choose the predictor that. Um, no yes. I mean, in any of these meta regression models that you do are inherently exploratory. Yeah, oh, yeah. We're oh, not yeah. Talking about any cause oh, no, no, no. Yeah, this is all observational. So, is highly correlated with the um, length of the intervention. And, um, and so you're like, well, do I put in that longer interventions are better? Or do I put in that more, inter more attrition right. leads to better results? Yeah. And um, so you really have to kind of, I think, know what your moderators are and how they're correlated yeah. before you decide how to talk about that. Because I would argue in this case that talking about the length of your intervention as being uh, an important predictor oh, here, yeah. if it totally overlaps with the amount of attrition, it's maybe not the length of the intervention that's yeah. Yeah. the important variable. Yeah. So you're picking out on the theoretical basis. Um, I think you start from and theory. And then, right, and sort of whether I can defend <coughs> that conclusion. Yeah. I think, I think as, um, so if we pretended that Sandra and Mark with each of their blocks of substantive uh, predictors, I mean, if they, if they were entering those all at once with those other methods predictors, um, chances are they would have described those different blocks of predictors as important blocks of potential moderators in the protocol. And within those, so you're setting up beforehand, a priori, um, you know, just a general class of these moderators that you're going to work with. Yes. Um, which one is more important? And I don't know, that's not really the right question, but it's, it's like you have to think about them both. Yes. And, and that's why I asked the question about collinearity, because I think somebody really smart should um, <laughs> solve this problem. Yeah. Like when we have these overlapping moderators, how do we think about what that means? Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure we have a good answer, really. Yeah. Sure we do. No, I don't think it has to 
Yes. Yeah, I have a question oh. about the next yes. question in terms of uh, how do I need to think about the number of studies in that? I mean, does that not impact? Here we had a lot of. Yeah, good, good question. So meta regressions are notoriously underpowered um, most of the time. I mean, you must have had a lot of studies to be able to look at hundreds. Yeah, so <laughs> Sandra and Mark, <laughs> the Vanderbilt camp doesn't count. <laughs> uh, 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 but for most of, I mean, it's the. While it was a toy data set for our purposes today, these 24 effect sizes, I don't think that's going to be that far off from a lot of meta-analyses. Um, and so you're using up, you're going to use up a whole bunch of, relatively, a whole bunch of your degrees of freedom um, <coughs> with a small number of moderators. Um, Is there some kind of rule about, you know, how many studies you need for... Um, I mean, in standard regression, oftentimes a, a rule of thumb that's thrown out there are 10 units per, per variable, uh, per predictor. It's a very rough rule of thumb. Um, you can power these things um, and figure it out really a lot more precisely, but chances are that that number that you get back before you start doing a review is going to be a lot higher than the existing literature for a lot of what we do. Um, so. Go into it knowing that a lot of it's going to be underpowered um, and be very conscientious about how you construct those regression models. Again, you, you're probably going to collect a lot of data on different study characteristics um, and so perhaps choose the more important ones. And what does it, what does it do that it's underpowered? How, how, what are the consequences of that? Oh, you won't, you won't find the relationship. But it's only in the Right. Yeah. So, so there may be there may be a relationship between attrition and the magnitude of the uh, variation in the magnitude of the effects. Uh, but if we've only got seven studies, we're dead in the water to to say anything about that. Probably, unless it's a really, really, really big relationship. And I, I'm maybe Mark and I are controversial uh, because we know they're under. We are um, because we know they're. of the coefficients. Yes, yes. And I mean, if you have some very large coefficients, yeah. um, I mean, it's not going to be statistically significant, but it gives you some exactly. ways to think about things like that. I mean, and you really do have to think about how you draw your conclusions at that yes. point, because you're exactly. going on shaky ground. Yes, but. yes, yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes? When you're doing these, that are moderating the effect of a of study characteristic, like is it an RCT or a, a dose test or some other uh, evaluation methodology, versus uh, regressors that we really, so I would call those sort of nuisance variables, versus regressors that we actually really care about, that would be something more akin to a heterogeneous effect, like men and women effects. Oh, yeah, so, mean, so, you, so. How do you treat those differently? How do you well, I, I think, I, you're the boss. There, there's no rule about how to how to how to treat those. Uh, an example of what uh, Sandra and Mark did. They they did they kind of separated their regressors, their predictors, into methodological moderators that they always wanted in there. Those were just really important. Um, and then they they filtered their substantive moderators through that model uh, with those controls already in there. Right. Um, that doesn't mean that that's how you have to do it. Mark's a big fan of, of that approach. Yeah, and I know other people, um, to create parsimonious models, you may um, put in some methodological variables first, and if those don't make a difference, yeah. right. you can right. You know, take them back out. Yes. So are you doing like a, a stepwise process with this? Yeah. Or, yeah, like a hierarchical process, right. yeah. Yeah. I mean, 
I would definitely advocate for being conscientious, whatever it is, about doing this, rather than just doing a full <coughs> stepwise sort of regression and seeing what, what falls out at the end of the day. Uh, but there are, there, are no, there are no hard and fast rules, um, as long as there's a good reason for why you threw variables in and when you threw them in and took them out. I think that's, that's perfectly fine. So when you're, let's try to stick, when you're, when you're looking at an overall effect, can you, I, I guess you'd be able to look at an overall effect size having control for method type, right? <coughs> mm -hmm. as, as well as being able to, to look for heterogeneous effects. Mm -hmm. Um, yes. So, that kind of goes back to the issue of collinearity. So, I know that when you do a regression for a primary research study, you usually do model of um, yep. And as part of that, you would check the collinearity. And if it, there's collinearity, you would Absolutely. do what you said. So, is that what's done in better regression? Because I, I haven't seen oh, yeah. that. I, yeah. Group model dually. Oh, yeah, that's. Um, okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and that's really what Sandra and Mark's example was, okay. too. Um, I just had another thought on this collinearity issue. There might be, there might actually be some centering techniques that we could use, at least, uh, actually, yeah, with a lot of different variables that might help us um, decrease that correlation within the regression model. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, so um, it's used sometimes in standard regression if we're throwing in things like interactions. Uh, interaction terms are yeah. notoriously uh, collinear with the things that they're. Uh, the product of. Uh, <laughs> uh, so uh, centering the, uh, the main effect uh, predictors uh, will, will usually reduce the correlation between those because you're going to end up with negative values um, if you're subtracting off the mean. Um, and so that'll reduce the correlation, um, or at least it should. Um, yeah. And one of the things that we've done, you know, because we'll explore the correlations among the predictors before we start, or the correlations among the moderators, and may discover that um, a class of moderators is highly correlated with each other. Like, say, um, total length of the intervention, how many sessions per week, and, you know, like a number of different dosage type variables. And so we've combined them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've done, you can absolutely. Do factor analysis yeah, exactly. Analysis. That's a good point. Or That's, you can make them into, yeah. you know, long every day of the week. Exactly. That's shorter, a good point. <laughs> you know, so you can turn them into yeah. combos. Yes. And yes. save degrees of freedom yeah. that way. Yes, that's a very good point. Data reduction techniques. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Yes. Um, is there a rule that? when the heterogeneity exceeds certain value, uh, it will be unreliable to do any lab analysis regardless of uh, mixed effects or effects. No, no. Um, I mean, w when you have a, a the, the question was when, when heterogeneity exceeds, is, is there a threshold of heterogeneity that would preclude one from conducting a meta-analysis? Um, either in a fixed effect or random effects framework. Um, with high levels of heterogeneity, that's strong evidence that the fixed effect assumption is not holding. Um, so we'd probably want to embrace a, we'd probably especially want to embrace a random effect, uh, effects framework in, in that case. But we can still do meta-analysis. Because I got a comment for a journal article I published four years ago, um, at the um, Cochrane collaboration and the chief editor he says, uh, one of the I square I, uh, for one, one sub, sub uh, sample meta analysis exceeds 95%. He says, when, when your I square is that high, it's, it will be unreliable to do any meta analysis for, for that sub sample. Um, hmm. So I, I'm not sure if there's like, you know, like a citation reference that's to suggest that. Uh, but some, some, yeah. some of the others that it's a marginal negative because you do. One of your examples show that you know, high score is like 90%. Yeah. So, yeah, I think, well, I definitely, you know, the, the random effect model is more yeah. perfect, but I don't know if, uh, you know, if there's like the point where you see that this study is just so heterogeneous. Maybe there are some, you know, some all hours. I, I, yeah. I did identify yeah. one 
one hour, what is your favorite study? Would you, you know, for some reason it's for like an experimentally very weird, bad size than any other studies. So I exclude that. Uh, yeah, um, I, w I would say if you're gonna start splitting up a set of effects, I don't know that I would immediately do it based off of I squared or something like this. Uh, a high I squared is going to tell you there's heterogeneity. If you start seeing unique clustering of effects, uh, assuming you have a large number, you can start to see some patterns, you may have different, uh, different groups that may not fit the operations that you've set, set out to do. But that's, that's really the, the only situation that I would probably say that these are not, these are not homogenous enough to conduct a, a systematic review or meta-analysis is if when if if you have studies in there that just are not conforming to the criteria that you set out to um, at the beginning. Um, otherwise, I think I think I'm generally in favor of going for it. Me too. And I think though, <laughs> I think what you're going to find in um, when, when editors give you a comment like that, they're going to be like, is not a very accurate reflection of the literature because there's so much variability. Mm -hmm. And to me, that sounds like a perfect reason to do a moderator yeah. analysis. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. Uh, because I agree with that editor that that mean probably isn't very meaningful. That doesn't really tell you yeah. about the effectiveness of that program. Yeah. There's so much variability. Um, and so he's right that you shouldn't just do a meta-analysis and report that mean. Yeah. Um, and, and then they would, this editor probably suggested a kind of ANOVA style yeah. moderator analysis, I think that. So it's, it's sort of thinking about whether you're interested in the mean right. or whether you're interested in variability in treatment effects yeah. or both. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, one thing that we get out of moderator analysis is an assessment of conditional homogeneity, right? Homogeneity conditional on the covariance. Um, and sometimes there, you might have one or two, one or two moderators that get you a whole, a whole lot, and then things look really quite a bit more homogenous after you control for certain things. Uh, I have seven questions. So um, um, in, in, in that meta-analysis study, I, I studied the effects of tracking classroom tracking on students' achievement. Oh, yeah. But I, you know, but based on the literature, I was most interested in whether, because there is a consensus that the, the tracking tends to benefit the lower achieving students, but some people think that they go back with higher achieving students. So I already, I already kind of look at the substantive, like sort of moderator as my key moderator of interest. But um, I found that, <coughs> Well, I read, well, in the tradition of like statistical sense, I think a moderator is a, a, is, a, is, is a variable that moderates the effect of a predictor and the outcome. And what if you find a vir another variable that moderates the moderator of interest and its relationship with the outcome, so, yeah. but it's not necessarily correlated with the effect size? So do you call this a moderator, or is it so you're, you're yeah. yeah, that's a good question. It, it is fair game to include interactions in um, in a meta regression, and so yeah, you could find a second variable that does change the relationship between the first and and the outcome. Um, and yeah, it doesn't necessarily have to be correlated with the outcome itself. And if it does, it should be actually immediate. Yeah, potentially. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. So is there like a I don't know. What, what, what do you like? I feel like you're coining something here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> A meta moderator? I don't know. <laughs> uh, under, under a few more assumptions. Yeah. If, if in the RFP, it, it, it seems like the founder is confused with the definition of moderator. 
um, it's in, in, not in the context of that analysis. I think it's just moderator is something that moderates whatever, you know, it's correlated with the outcome. Yeah. And, uh, but it's not like the traditional uh, sort of predictor of the you know, outcome. But uh, I think in meta analysis, that is a predictor mm -hmm. of the effect size, yeah. the variant, variation yes. of the effect size across studies. Yes. Um, so um, so I, I guess just the, the moderator definition really is, does not apply here. Like in a, in a meta analysis context, it's, it's defined differently. Yeah, I think it would be a little bit different in that specific context. Um, I'd have to think about it a little bit more, but it is it is fair game. Yeah, I think you're allowed. Other questions? This side of the room's been quiet. It's lunchtime. Uh, Ian. In, into what? I'm sorry. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, I think so. Um, so Pico um, is um, partici participants or persons. Pro sorry, I always get Picos and Utahs mixed up. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I think that's a. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I think so. And uh, Betsy Becker, one of our students a few years ago, they were talking about UTOS, Chromebox kind of uh, framework for thinking about. Uh, construct validity, and they added methods on there. So I think we can look at methods, treatments, outcomes, participants, settings. Um, I think that's a nice framework for describing the landscape of a set of effects, um, because ultimately we're in the business of generalizability um, in that analysis, and I think that's a really nice framework. I agree. Other questions? <coughs> One more. Um, what do you, let's say you, um, I guess it's not a comparison. Um, assume you ignore the whole time you use kind of a, a higher list of moderators, and you just want to explore whether um, a study level variable has an impact on the effect. What happens if you have, um, within one study, there are different um, moderators? And it's not sort of an easy count. So you can't just say this study had all men or this study had all women. But a certain number of the people in the study were men, a certain number were women, and you want to pull out that gender difference from within that study and compare it to other studies. Yeah. How would you, Sammy, how would you split the effects that within the study to compare it to do a sub analysis? Yeah, sometimes, I mean. Uh, I, I, I'm understanding, yeah. Um, that, that's one of the sour parts of this, uh, this work, is sometimes we are at the mercy of reporting. Um, if that's a really, really, really interesting split that you want to make, you can potentially ask for those frequencies. Um, We're assuming they're reporting, is what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, um, <clears throat> you know, when you're coding studies, <coughs> It's about the whole study, so you might record the proportion yes, of males in exactly. the sample or the proportion okay. of yeah. minorities or whatever. So you use um, it more as a continuous. So, right, and I would variable. use that as a continuous variable. But yeah. um, if you have a literature where a lot of your results are broken down by common demographic subgroups, so they give you the overall effect of their intervention, and then they say, here's the effect for boys, here's the effect for girls, um, you could take the effect sizes from those two samples. There's dependency issues, there's lots of other complicated issues with that, but you could theoretically get the 
boy effect size and the girl effect mm -hmm. size from every study. Right. Yeah. And do some work with that. Yeah. I, That's what I'm saying. I'm like, assuming you could do that. How yeah. do you then do like this actual substitution <coughs> for the overall analysis? You could do that for a study. But how do you then? Oh, you'd have to have, have, you'd have, to have all your studies give you that. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Otherwise. Or a subset of a subset. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Probably end up with a little missing data there. <laughs> Most likely. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's a thorny. Yeah. 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 Well, this is probably uh, about between study comparison graphs and within study comparison graphs. <coughs> yeah. Okay, uh, it's after 12 now, so I guess we should start heading over for lunch. Thank you all for coming to moderator analysis. <laughs> And um, as Terry mentioned, there are going to be some office hours throughout the colloquium. I believe my office hours are